The Soviet assault team advanced through the ruins of Königsberg with the confidence of veterans. They used the cover of the smoke and buildings and cleared the way with short bursts of submachine gun fire. It was April 1945 and the Red Army was clearing the last German stronghold in East Prussia. the headquarters of the 3rd Bielorussian Front, Marshal Vasilevsky followed events with satisfaction. He was generous with his praise. But many of his commanders knew he was mentally selecting the men to take with him on his next assignment. He had already been told what to expect. In the summer of 1944, I learned that after the Bielorussian operation, I would have to go to the Far East. Stalin told me that I would be given command of the army there for the war against Japan. Stalin had promised the Allies that he would join the war against Japan within 90 days of Germany's surrender. In turn, he had been assured that certain Soviet territorial demands in the Far East would be met. As the fighting continued in the East Prussian capital of Königsberg, the Soviet Union denounced its 1941 neutrality pact with Japan. It had done little to ease tension between the two powers. Stalin had kept almost 40 divisions stationed in the Far East throughout the war. The Soviet denunciation of the neutrality pact was a clear warning of Stalin's intentions. Now, the Red Army began to build up its forces in the Far East. The new arrivals included the 53rd Army and 6th Guards Tank Army, redeployed from Czechoslovakia. Their experience of fighting in the mountains of Romania and Austria would prove extremely valuable in the Far East. Some of the soldiers thought they were going home after the defeat of Nazi Germany. But their war wasn't over yet. Japan had attacked Manchuria in northeast China in 1931, before Hitler even came to power. It led to border clashes with the Soviets at Lake Hassan in 1938 and Halkingol in 1939. Japan had embarked on a policy of ruthless imperial expansion, which brought war with China, America, and the British Empire. After Germany's defeat, the Allies met for a conference at Potsdam, near Berlin. There, the US, the UK, and China issued a stark threat to Japan. Surrender, or face prompt and utter destruction. The Japanese response was predictable. Prime Minister Kantaro Suzuki stated that the Japanese government would ignore the declaration and move forward to successfully conclude the war. 
The response condemned the country to a terrible, unprecedented fate. In the New Mexico desert, the Americans had just tested the first atomic bomb. On the 26th of July, 1945, the USS Indianapolis delivered the Little Boy bomb to the US base on Tinian Island. Two days later, General Marshall, the US Chief of Staff, confirmed the order authorizing its use against Japan. The primary target was the city of Hiroshima. Alternative targets were Kokura and Nagasaki. Many civilians had been evacuated from Hiroshima because of the threat of air raids. But at the time of the attack, there were still 350,000 people living in the city. On the 6th of August, at 8.15 a.m., the bomb was dropped from a height of nine kilometers. 43 seconds later, 600 meters above the city, the bomb exploded with the force of 13,000 tons of TNT. 70,000 people were killed almost instantly. It's estimated that the effects of radiation killed the same number again within six months. Within five years, total fatalities had reached 200,000. Three days later, the Americans dropped a plutonium bomb with an explosive force equivalent to 21 kilotons of TNT on Nagasaki. According to a report of the Nagasaki prefecture, everyone within a one kilometer radius was killed instantly. Within two kilometers, almost all houses were destroyed. And within three kilometers, all flammable material was set on fire. By the end of 1945, total deaths in Nagasaki had reached 80,000. In the years that followed, thousands more died from leukemia and cancers caused by the effects of radiation. The two nuclear blows against Japan did not immediately break the country's will to fight on. Few outside the affected areas knew anything about the bombings. Members of Japan's Supreme Council still believed they could negotiate an end to the war. But a third catastrophic blow was materializing. The Japanese had detected heavy troop movements along the Trans-Siberian Railway. It could mean only one thing. US forces had just completed a brutal struggle for the island of Okinawa, 300 miles south of the Japanese mainland. The experience taught them that an invasion of the Japanese homeland would be a long and bloody affair. The war might drag on for at least another year. But a blow from the seasoned Red Army could prove decisive, particularly if it was struck against a strategically vital part of the Japanese Empire. Manchuria, in northeast China, was such a place. With Korea to the south, it was indispensable to Japan's economy. Its industries produced coal, iron, steel, electricity, and more than half of Japan's synthetic fuel. Factories had been moved here from Japan to be out of range of US bombers. 
The loss of Manchuria would make it impossible for Japan to fight on. Через большой хинган и всю Манчжурию на танках перейти? Это тебе не шоссе Франкфурт-Берлин. А еще через пару недель дожди пойдут. С горючкой проблемы будут. Я вот что предлагаю. Значит, берем... The sheer size of the theater of operations was daunting enough. Manchuria is as big as Germany and Italy combined. Its central plain is like a fortress, surrounded by a ring of mountains. And the remoteness of its frontiers was another important factor. Between the Far East and the Russian interior, the roads and railways simply did not exist to move or supply a big army. Japanese forces in Manchuria, centered on the Kwantung army, had been greatly weakened to reinforce the Pacific, but still contained 700,000 men. The commander of the Kwantung army, General Yamada, knew it was impossible to defend the whole length of the frontier. So he placed only light screening forces along the border. His reserves were located in the interior, they were stationed close to railway hubs, ready for rapid deployment when the enemy's intentions became clear. The Soviet High Command planned nothing less than a double envelopment of the whole of Manchuria. One pincer would attack from Mongolia, the other from Vladivostok. The attack from the west would be made by Marshal Malinovsky's Transbaikal Front. From the east, by Marshal Meretskov's first Far Eastern Front. The distance between the two forces was 3,000 kilometers. In the path of General Kravchenko's Sixth Guards tank army lay the greater Chingang range. Kravchenko's orders stipulated that he was to cross the mountains in no more than five days. Any holdup, and the Japanese could send troops to fortify the passes. And then, the entire Soviet offensive could grind to a halt. At the Yalta conference in February 1945, Stalin had promised that the Soviet Union would join the war against Japan no more than 90 days after Germany's surrender. He would keep his word, just. Exactly 90 days after Germany's surrender, troops of the Soviet First Far Eastern Front prepared to go into action. August in Manchuria is the rainy season. The downpour began on the 8th of August, the eve of the offensive. Some river levels rose by two or three meters. The ground was soon sodden. The Manchurian strategic offensive operation would begin in the dark, in the pouring rain. There was to be no artillery preparation. The Japanese were to have no warning. Ну и погодка черт бы побрал. Сколько там еще? 34 минуты. The attack would be led by assault teams supported by ISU-152 self-propelled guns. But their main weapon would be surprise. The assault teams were built around hardened veterans of the fighting in Europe. For identification, they sewed patches of white cloth to their caps and tunics. The password was Petrov. At 1 a.m. on the 9th of August, assault troops of the 1st Far Eastern Front 
began their advance. Scouts led the way, laying telephone wire for the infantry to follow. At the command posts, officers waited anxiously for news. If the attack failed, it would be plan B, a four-hour artillery barrage. The Red Army's sudden onslaught against Manchuria took the Japanese by surprise. Some soldiers were caught still in their barracks. Those that manned their defensive positions in time were soon encircled and are taken out with explosives or flamethrowers. The assault teams used infiltration tactics to bypass enemy strongpoints and advance up to 20 kilometers in the first few hours of the operation. The city of Mudanjiang was next in their sights. The Soviet advance was so fast and unexpected that it took several hours for news of the attack to filter back to Guangdong Army headquarters and from there to Tokyo. The Japanese command had believed that the Soviets would not be ready to attack for several more weeks. General Yamada was so sure of this that on the 9th of August, he was at a conference hundreds of miles from his headquarters. The Trans-Baikal Front Offensive began at dawn and met little resistance. Kravchenko's 6th Guards Tank Army led the way, with 75,000 soldiers, 6,000 vehicles, 800 tanks, and 200 self-propelled guns. The T-34s and Lend-Lease Shermans advanced alongside old BT-5s and T-26s, which had been stationed in the Far East throughout the war. They overran the weak Japanese units in their path and advanced 120 kilometers on the first day. A simultaneous supporting attack was made along the rail line. As the first reports of the Soviet attack reached the Japanese high command, the senior staff did not initially comprehend its scale. Yamada received instructions to maintain a staunch defense of areas occupied by Japanese troops and prepare for large-scale military operations. But there was more news that day. From Hiroshima came a detailed report 
on the scale of the devastation. Then, a few hours after the Soviet attack, news arrived that a second bomb had been dropped on Nagasaki. These blows, coming one after another, were a profound shock to the Japanese leadership. Prime Minister Suzuki told a meeting of the Supreme Council that the Soviet Union's entry into the war made the situation hopeless. It was impossible to continue. The Allied terms offered at Potsdam must be accepted. That night, the meeting was resumed in the presence of Emperor Hirohito. It continued into the small hours of the morning. Following the Emperor's lead, the Council finally agreed to the Allied terms. But they demanded an assurance that the Emperor would retain his position. This was rejected. Only unconditional surrender was acceptable. The war continued. In eastern Manchuria, the infantry advanced with well-practiced assault drills. The men blasted their way in through the armored door. It became routine to completely demolish these bunkers. Otherwise, Japanese survivors would hide and wait for the first wave to pass, then rush back to their positions and resume firing. Mine clearance experts who had served in Germany were struck by the simplicity of Japanese minefields. They caused little holdup for the Soviet tanks and infantry. The Red Army met more serious opposition to the north, around the Hyla fortified zone. After several days of heavy fighting, the Japanese defenders were encircled. Then, the Air Force went in. More than 80 Soviet bombers dropped 120 tons of bombs on the Japanese. Two hours later, they surrendered. Kravchenko's tank army, meanwhile, struggled through the passes of the greater Chingan Mountains. The 26-ton tanks crawled along the old caravan routes. Where the track was too narrow, they widened it with explosives or improvised other solutions. Captain Dmitry Loza led a tank battalion through the mountains. Two tank recovery vehicles were chained together at the top of the mountain. One had a winch, the other acted as the anchor. A tank was attached to the winch cable and put into first gear. Then it was slowly lowered down the slope. And this is how we got them down safely. By the 12th of August, the mountains were behind them. They were through with one day to spare. They left an old BT tank at a crossing and inscribed on its turret, Soviet tanks passed here 1945. But as the tanks began to cross the plain, dark specks appeared on the horizon. Japanese aircraft arrived to strafe the Soviet columns with cannon and bombs. Some even made suicidal ramming attacks. Nine kamikaze attacks were recorded by the tank crews. 
but not a single tank was lost. Tank tracks quickly chewed the wet dirt roads into box. So resupply became a major problem. Two transport divisions of the 12th Air Army were given the job of flying fuel to the front. But despite making 160 deliveries per day, it wasn't enough. As the Soviet advance struggled on, on the 14th of August, news came that the Japanese government had agreed to surrender. A message had been sent to the governments of Great Britain, America, the Soviet Union, and China that it was Emperor Hirohito's will that Japan accept all the Allies' conditions set out at Potsdam. The war should have been over, but the order to surrender was slow to reach the Kwantung army. General Yamada's orders only instructed him to immediately burn all banners, imperial portraits and edicts, and all secret documents. In Western Manchuria, the increasingly one-sided fight caused many Japanese troops to surrender regardless. In Eastern Manchuria, the Soviet First Far Eastern Front faced a different situation. Suicide attacks by Japanese infantry. A special unit of 1,700 soldiers under an officer named Kobayashi was sent into battle near Mudanjang. General Beloborodov witnessed their attack. Soldiers in green uniforms emerged from camouflaged foxholes and ran at the tanks. The paratroopers shot them down. They were decimated by machine guns. But more of them emerged from foxholes and trenches, throwing themselves at the tanks. On the 15th of August, 1945, as Emperor Hirohito made a radio address to the Japanese people announcing his decision to surrender, Soviet tanks of the 5th Army rolled on towards Mudanjang. The next day, the Soviet general staff issued a bulletin. The Emperor's statement of the 14th of August regarding Japan's capitulation was only a general statement accepting unconditional surrender. No order was issued to the armed forces to cease fire, and Japanese forces continue to resist. Thus, in effect, there has been no capitulation. The Japanese aircraft was acting strangely. It flew slowly and waggled its wings as it approached the Soviet lines. The anti-aircraft gunners took a chance and held their fire. It was a message from General Yamada's staff informing the Red Army that he had ordered a ceasefire. It was not news to Marshal Vasilevsky. His headquarters had already received a radio communication from General Yamada, stating that he had ordered his men to lay down their arms. Some Japanese troops began to surrender, including the garrison of the Haila fortified area holding the rail line. But other units did not receive or chose to ignore the order. So Vasilevsky sent Yamada an ultimatum. 
I propose that at noon on the 20th of August, you cease all military operations against Soviet forces, lay down your arms and surrender. The waterlogged plane meant that the railway line was the only way for Kravchenko's tanks to advance. But a two-day march along the rails was tough on men and vehicles. Any breakdown brought the whole column to a standstill. Some tanks were simply shoved off the embankment to make way. But the long advance was taking its toll. One corps was down from 200 tanks to just 70. Marshal Vasilevsky now demanded the immediate capture of Changchun, Mukden, Jilin and Harbin by highly mobile task forces to be supported by airborne landings. On the 19th of August, seven Lisunov twos carrying 175 officers and men left for Jilin. They were escorted by four fighters and three PE-2 bombers. The Japanese command had been officially informed of the landing. As the second aircraft came in to land, the Japanese suddenly opened fire. The unit's commander was Colonel Dmitry Krutsky. I was standing by the aircraft's wheel when the Japanese opened fire. I received a light facial wound. I led my soldiers into the attack and we captured eight Hotchkiss machine guns and took 40 prisoners. To tell the truth, we tried not to take prisoners. We were too mad. We'd had a deal and they started shooting at us. Airborne units, 200 strong, were also sent to seize control of the Japanese airfields at Harbin, Mukden and Changchun. As Soviet fighters circled the landing zones, the transport planes made their drop. Within 24 hours, the paratroopers were relieved by Soviet tanks. On the 19th of August, Japanese troops began to surrender en masse. Most combat operations came to an end, but fighting continued on the island of Sakhalin, where Soviet infantry carried out amphibious landings on the 20th of August. Five days later, the Red Army entered the capital Toyohara and accepted the surrender of 18,000 Japanese troops. To prevent the destruction of important industrial and naval facilities, detachments of the 6th Guards Tank Army boarded trains at Mukden and raced south to the large Japanese naval bases at Port Arthur and Dolmi. Paratroopers were sent ahead to make sure the Americans didn't get there first. The two powers were already positioning themselves for the Cold War that was to come. In one of the most remote outposts of the Soviet Empire, naval gunners were hard at work. The coastal battery at Cape Lopatka was firing at an island, barely visible on the horizon. The target was Shumshu, the northernmost of the Japanese-held Kuril Islands. It was the prelude to an invasion. In exchange for joining the war against Japan, Stalin was promised certain Japanese territories, including the Kuril Islands and South Sakhalin. He also had his eyes on Hokkaido. But the new American president, Harry Truman, was alarmed by these concessions. In his view, too much had been promised to the Soviets. He asked his commanders to look at ways to prevent the Soviet occupation of the islands. 
So Stalin decided to present the Allies with a fait accompli. A few hours after the Emperor of Japan announced his nation's surrender, Marshal Vasilevsky ordered the invasion of the Kuril Islands to proceed. The operation would be launched from Soviet bases in the Kamchatka Peninsula. Their initial objectives were the islands of Shumshu, Paramushir, and Onokotan. The invasion would be led by Major General Dyakov's 101st Rifle Division. It had been an intensive training for an opposed amphibious landing for more than six months. They would be accompanied by Marines and NKVD border troops. The landing force would be 10,000 strong. The main objective was Shumshu, the island closest to Kamchatka. Perpetual cloud prevented any effective Soviet air reconnaissance, but it was known that the Japanese had constructed a strong defensive line, including pillboxes and anti-tank traps, to protect the key naval base at Kataoka. At the island's northern tip, there were several bunkers and an anti-aircraft battery mounted on the Mariupol, a Soviet tanker stranded in 1943. The garrison of 8,500 men was commanded by Major General Fusaki. General Dyakov opted for a beach landing in the north. Dyakov thought that a direct assault on the port of Kataoka was too risky. But his land campaign carried its own risks. If the Japanese could bring in reinforcements from the neighboring island of Paramushir, General Fusaki would have 23,000 men, including 16 amphibious tanks, at his disposal. At 4 a.m. on the 17th of August, the invasion force of 42 ships set sail from Kamchatka in thick fog. It was a day-long voyage to Shumshu. Radio silence was enforced. Messages were sent only by signal lamp or semaphore. At 2 a.m. the next morning, the fleet arrived off the landing beach. The assault troops would have to contend with powerful currents and freezing water. The regular bombardment from the Cape Lopatka battery caused the Japanese to miss the landing of the Soviet advance guard. It was detected only an hour later, by which time they were more than a mile inland. The Japanese guns belatedly opened fire. Soviet naval guns set fire to the lighthouse, which acted as a beacon for the rest of the landing ships. The next wave was landed 200 meters from the shore. Hundreds were carried away by powerful currents, but enough men reached the beach to begin the assault. Heavy cloud cover meant there was no air support. They were on their own. But the light Japanese tanks proved vulnerable even to Soviet anti-tank rifles. Seven tanks were destroyed with anti-tank grenades. First Sergeant Babich distinguished himself by destroying two tanks single-handedly. It was a massacre. Only one Japanese tank escaped. The infantry moved forward to assault the enemy strongpoints, supported by artillery, which had now been landed at the beach. Within 24 hours, the Japanese opened negotiations. General Fusaki announced a ceasefire the following day, 
And on the morning of the 22nd of August, the garrison laid down its arms. The last battle of the Second World War had cost the lives of more than a thousand soldiers on both sides. On the 25th of August, the garrison of Onokotan surrendered, followed by Matsua with its naval base and airfield. The rest of the Kuril Islands soon followed suit. Soviet forces were planning to occupy Hokkaido, the northernmost of the Japanese home islands. But the operation was cancelled by Stalin in the face of forthright opposition from the United States. But in line with the agreement signed at Yalta, the Soviet Union now took full possession of the former Japanese territories of South Sakhalin and the Kuril Islands. On the 2nd of September, 1945, the Japanese instrument of surrender was signed aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. It was signed on behalf of the Soviet Union by General Derivianko. The Soviet Union had earned its place at the ceremony by its decisive action in Manchuria, which proved a crushing blow to Japanese hopes of continued resistance. But the first hints of coolness had crept into relations between the wartime allies. They had already begun to form two distinct camps. And five years later, Soviet and American pilots would meet over Korea as enemies. But for now, the Allies celebrated their victory. The largest war in history was at an end. The fighting had raged across three continents and four oceans. It had claimed the lives of an estimated 70 million people. But now, the soldiers were coming home. They believed that this war was the last, the very last. How could it be otherwise?